very, very uh, snowy here in Texas, as most of y'all know. And um, it, we have some contingencies for if the power goes out. If the power goes out, um, Dad's going to keep on preaching, and uh, we'll we have someone else on the panel also recording it, and we'll post that later. So just so y'all know, so you're praying for Dad today, and you're also praying for the electricity. <laughs> so please do so. Um, and with that, we have uh, with us Elder Mike Montgomery. How are you doing tonight, Brother Mike? Doing well, thank you. Please remind us where you're serving. I am pastor of the Old School Primitive Baptist Church of Kennedale, Texas. And uh, we're thankful to have you on, as always. And we also have uh, Elder Mike Hughes as our guest panelist for tonight. How are you doing, Brother Mike? I'm just fine, Brother Daniel. Thank you. Uh, we're uh, grateful to have you on, Brother Mike. And if you would, please uh, return our prayer for us. If you would bow with us. Dear kind Heavenly Father, as we come before Thee this evening with this special opportunity to come and look unto Thee for a short time with these brethren and all those that are connected with us via this technology, how thankful we are for this, that we can lift our hearts and our minds for a short time away from all of the concerns and cares that have been going on in these past days. And Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy divine grace and mercy as thou has been with us and we thank thee for thy truth especially this night and heavenly father we would ask that thou might be with all those that are affected by this terrible storm throughout the land those that have been suffering over these past days that thou would grant them warmth and comfort and that thou would give them a spiritual lift as well and that they might feel thy presence heavenly father we Pray that thou would be with this dear brother this evening, that thou would grant him liberty and presence of mind for the topic that may be upon his heart and upon his mind, that he might speak in thy holy name once again, and that it might be according to thy will, o Heavenly Father, and especially that we might have hearts that would be open to receive and minds that would be clear to think upon these truths that he would speak of and that thou would send to us that thou would help us, O oh Lord, just for a short time indeed to, to be lifted to that mountain, to look upon thee and that we might dwell upon these thoughts in the days ahead, contemplate them in our heart, take with them and that we might draw closer to thee. Heavenly Father, we pray for those that are upon the beds of affliction, wherever they may be, thou knowest their needs far better than we, that thou would be with those that need thee in comforting and mourning of heart, that thou would be with those that need thee in special ways that we may not be aware. Have mercy upon all these brethren here this evening, that thou would bless them and bless them in their efforts to serve thee and the little congregations that they uh, serve throughout the land, that thou would bless them as well. Watch over us now, o Lord, in our thoughts and our words and our time together in this evening. And thank thee, O Lord, for thy son and what he means to us and for his precious blood, for his truths and his comfort and love that we have because of thy divine will. We ask this in his name and for his sake. Amen. 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 And with that, Brother Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you. And Brother Mike, thank you for that sweet, humble prayer. <clears throat> Good evening to everybody. I hope everyone is doing uh, well. Warm, you're warm. You're dry and you haven't run into too many problems from the cold. But for all those who have suffered, our hearts go out to you and our prayers are there for you. And we trust that the electricity will come back on for everybody soon and everybody will get water who doesn't have it. And just God bless you is our prayer. <clears throat> I told uh, Brother Jerry and Brother Daniel last week sometime what I thought I felt burdened to talk about. And should be no surprise to any of the men on the panel here, but like so many times, you have every good intention of following through with your threat, I mean, with your <clears throat> promise to speak on something, and then your mind gets changed, or you feel like your mind is being changed. 
and you you're you're faced with two ways to go. You can you can decide you want to go with the old the, the the thing you thought you were, or are you going to go with this thing where you're being tugged to go? <clears throat> and since I've been uh, trying to preach for, I think forty years now, I've I've found that the best thing to do is just step out on faith and follow the leadership of your heart. And if the Lord's in it, it'll be okay. <clears throat> and so that's what I'm going to do tonight. Again, last week, at, uh, I was privileged to speak to the Church of Bellflower. And uh, I, I tried to talk out of the book of Galatians. I wanted to talk out of the six chapters, Brother Jerry probably recalls. But I spent a lot of time trying to talk about the purpose of Galatians. And that may be what I end up doing tonight for the next uh, 20 minutes, is just talk about the purpose of the epistle to the Galatians. And, but I want to do, I do want to read a verse just to say that I read it and it's in Galatians chapter six and verse one to start things off. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, as with any verse of the Bible, it must be seen in its context. This verse can just be taken as it is and probably several good lessons taught just from it without any thought of the context. But I really think that if you don't see the context, you really miss what the Apostle Paul is getting at here. Why, why would he say what he said at this juncture in this epistle? Now, I want to say, just to clarify and make sure everybody knows, I believe the Lord inspired the Apostle Paul to write Galatians, just like he inspired Paul and all the other inspired writers to write what they wrote. But I want to be clear also on this. Paul had a reason, a, 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 an urgent need to write this letter. Uh, this is a, He wrote what he was thinking, and surely he, he wrote what he felt led of the Spirit, and the, Lord, and the Lord was pleased with what Paul wrote. And Otherwise, we wouldn't have it recorded for us today. But he was addressing a grievous problem, and it was the it was what I call the problem, the problem that dogged him almost everywhere he went. You can see aspects of that problem being discussed in almost every one of his letters. But in particular, you see it in Galatians, in Romans, in First and Second Corinthians, and in Philippians. Those epistles form a volume, if you will, of his letters. The first two epistles, I think, were the ones to the Thessalonians. And some of that problem is expressed there, but not like it is in Romans, Galatians, the Corinthians, and, and the Philippians. It's mentioned in, in Colossians and Ephesians, but not in the same kind of way, with the same intensity that it is in these other epistles. You know, Romans is always looked at as his great systematic statement of systematic theology. I, I deny that. I, not that Romans is not a great, great letter, but to call the Apostle Paul a systematic theology is to miss the point entirely. He wasn't what theologians like to call systematic theology. He was a theologian, all right, but he wrote based upon the need that was before him, and the need for why he wrote Galatians was vastly different than the need that he had for writing Romans. I think he wrote Galatians a couple of years before he wrote Romans. I think you can find some of Galatians in all of these other epistles that I, I mentioned that forms this volume. But Galatians is where he, he said certain things first. And he said them in a very personal way. I think what we find in Galatians is the most personal statements by the Apostle Paul than you find in any of his other epistles. You see his heart. You see his love for these people. You see the love expressed not only in endearments, but in particular in, in the indignation that he had, like a father had for, has for an erring child. He was so upset with these people for what they were doing. He used uh, certain expressions that when you understand what he's saying, you begin to wonder how, just how angry was he? He was very angry, and he was extremely upset with the people who were causing the problems. So what is the problem? What is the problem? May I just say before I 
tell you what I think the problem is. It is the problem for us today in different guises under different names. This is the problem that has afflicted the church since its inception. And, and in this case, it took the form of the integration of the Gentiles into the New Testament church. This was the impetus of the problem. You see, the New Testament church started off with, no surprise, Jewish believers only. And we see that uh, it was for the, for a, until the 10th chapter of Acts, there are no Gentiles included in the church. Uh, but what we do find is that the people who comprised the church until the Gentiles were brought into it were Jews, and they saw themselves as Jews, and they were happy to see themselves as Jews. As a matter of fact, most Jews, whether believers or not, they saw this new sect as a sect within Judaism. They didn't see it as separate and apart from Judaism. It was a part of Judaism. It wasn't a very likable part of Judaism because of what it accentuated about Jesus of Nazareth. But it was comprised of Jews who spoke as Jews, who lived as Jews, who saw themselves as Jews, who were thankful to be Jews. As a matter of fact, they still, they still uh, were had awe for the temple and for the Torah and for the various traditions of the fathers. Well, in in the beginning of the book of Acts, you see the the, the impetus of the church on that day of Pentecost. And you see the spirit coming down in great power upon the apostles and upon those that believe. And then you see the church continuing to grow. And you see that sad, sad moment when Stephen is martyred. Uh, and at that terrible scene, Saul of Tarsus is leading the, ra- the, the, the crowd to do what they did. We find the first great uh, persecution of the church was by Jews against Jews. And this is not a Jewish problem, by the way. I'm saying the word Jews a lot, but it's not a Jewish problem. It is a human problem because the problem that was then is the problem we can see today among us Gentiles. And Paul warned the Gentiles about this, but here here it is. When when Peter's at Joppa at one Simon of Tanners, and he's sitting on that roof, and I always... uh, crazily think he's got this aluminum thing. No, he doesn't have that. He's sitting on the roof, just meditating on the word of God. And you see, he has that vision of a sheet let down and all manners of beasts, clean and unclean. Clean and unclean. You see, that meant something to a Jew. It meant something to Peter. It meant something to the great apostle Peter. After the day of Pentecost, it still meant something to Peter that he be ritually clean because the voice said, rise, Peter, slay and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord, nothing unclean or common has entered into my mouth. Well, see, here's a man who was the great apostle Peter, the great preacher of the gospel on the day of Pentecost. And he was perfectly content with his Jewishness, with his culture, with the society to which he belonged. That's a lot like us. Our society means a lot to us. Our culture as primitive Baptist means a lot to us. We don't want to mess it up. We love it. I love it. I don't want to change it. But culture means nothing when it is put above where it is supposed to be. When we put culture above the gospel, above the truth of the gospel, above the purpose of the gospel, we have made culture into an idol and we're guilty of idolatry. Well, when Peter got the news that what God has cleansed, call not thou uncommon. He went down to Cornelius' house, and we, we know the story. He, he preached the gospel. They, they were baptized, and the Holy Ghost came upon them just as mightily as it did upon those Jews in the day of Pentecost. And the, and the church back home in Jerusalem, I think, I think they were not pleased. They were not happy to hear what Peter had done. So Peter had to rehearse what he was going to say. He, he was careful in what he said, and, and he had eyewitnesses. You preachers, when you have to go someplace controversial, take your deacons with you. <laughs> you know, take some witnesses with you. Well, you know, I think they had to accept that the facts were the facts, and the truth of the matter was the truth of the matter. 
But don't you get the sense that they just kind of wipe the brow and say, that's a one-off. That's an exception. It ain't going to happen to us again. Well, let's, not, let's hope it doesn't happen again. That's how they were thinking. And they, and they kind of felt like they were justified in that until something happened up in a town called Antioch. And up in Antioch is the first New Testament church that had a mixed membership of Jew and Gentile. And you'd think the churches in Judea would be thrilled with that. Nope. They sent Barnabas to spy him out to see, is this real or not? When Barnabas got up there, I think he was shocked to find out this is as real as real can get. This is exciting. This is powerful. You know what he did? He says, I got to go find this Saul of Tarsus because Saul had had his Damascus Road experience. And he goes to Tarsus where Paul is and he brings him down. Paul and Barnabas become partners together in, in the ministry and they embark upon their first preaching tour in the surrounding areas. And as long as they were preaching to the Jews, it was okay for the Jews. But when the Jews began to see how the Gentiles just fed and were so excited at what Paul was preaching, it disturbed them because it interfered with their business and it caused, it caused an upset in their life that they preferred not to happen. This would be true for the unbelieving Jews. Well, for the believing Jews, it was also a problem. And I'll tell you, the problem was this. We are Jews, and we cannot afford to lose our ritual clean position by mingling with uncircumcised Gentiles. So we need these Gentiles to come in to us the way we think they should. So they become clean like us. And you think, well, how's that? No, sure. No, that's exactly what Peter did in Antioch. And that's what Paul writes about in the second chapter of Galatians. We all have... We all have our predilections and we all have our presumptions. And sometimes we, we mistake those things for actual fact. When what we should be in any case is excited when the gospel is preached in power and demonstration of the spirit wherever God is pleased for it to be preached. And may we be blessed to get over our presuppositions and be humble and open to the will of God, just like our forefathers of old, to go preach where we feel led of the Spirit to go preach without any hindrance, at least from the church. Well, the Galatians had now been beset upon, but I think some preachers from Jerusalem, some believing Jews who were fanatical about their Jewishness and about their, the need for them to maintain Jewish culture within the New Testament church. And they came up to, to Galatia shortly after Paul had left, and they probably said something like this. Well, what Paul said was good. Yes, he preached to you the Jesus that we believe, but he left out some key points that until you know what those are, until you do what those things say to do, you really can't have the kind of blessings that you should be having in God's kingdom. It was, a, it was the issue was what makes you worthy of God's blessings? The issue is what makes you able to participate in God's kingdom? And Paul the apostle, when he got word of this, he's stunned. He's, he's, he's shocked because he just left Galatia. They were fine when he left. You know what they believed? When Paul left, they believed in salvation by grace and by grace alone. They believed that they were Gentiles just as worthy of the kingdom as any Jewish believer. And they knew why they were worthy. They knew they were worthy because of what Christ did for them as much as for the Jews. He died on the cross for the sins of all his people, Jew and Gentile. He, he didn't uh, segregate between the two, but he, bro he broke down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, and he made peace. And he brought them together. That was always the purpose of God, ultimately, was to bring the Gentiles into his kingdom. Yes, he had Gentile children of God long before Christ came, but he didn't have access, the Gentiles didn't have access to the kingdom like they did until after Christ died for their sins on the cross. So worthiness, the, the ability to let someone enjoy the blessings of the kingdom unfettered, in the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free. You see, Paul preached a law-free gospel. 
He preached the gospel that said Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. Gentiles don't have to observe the law. Gentiles don't have to uh, mind ritual cleanliness like uh, our forefathers did. We couldn't do them anyway. Why should we uh, put that yoke upon our Gentile brethren? But the, the gospel made room for Jew and Gentile. It made room for Jews to live like Jews and Gentiles to live like Gentiles. It made room for men to be men and women to be women. It, it, it made room. It was the gospel is inclusive. It's not exclusive. The gospel welcomes. It doesn't shun. It doesn't uh, cast aside. Yes, it can be a sword that cuts uh, both for and against. But in its elemental sense, the gospel is the urgent proclamation that Christ has died for your sins and he has a place for you in his kingdom. And that is good news indeed. And there's nothing that you have to do other than he has to, he has to born you again. He has to regenerate you. You know, the, you can't see nor enter the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. And we know that we can't born ourselves again. A Jew can't do it any more than a Gentile can. So we are all recipients of the grace of God. And Paul says, as long as I live, I don't want to frustrate that grace of God. I don't want to make light of God's grace. I want to take it seriously because in that grace, I have found the sweetest liberty that I have ever been able to see in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And I thought that I had it all when I was Saul of Tarsus. But now I find I had nothing when I was Saul of Tarsus like I have it now as Paul, the apostle. Now, I didn't earn it either. You know, Paul wasn't looking for Jesus when he was struck down the road to Damascus. He hated Jesus, and he was trying to des destroy the church. So Galatians is Paul's attempt to turn the tide against false teachers. Let me tell you, these false teachers were very good at what they did. They were fanatical. They, they firmly believed what they did. They weren't being necessarily uh, two-faced about it. They really believed what they were teaching, and they really tried hard to sell it to the Galatians. You know, that sounds like a problem sometimes we have today with certain preachers who think they've got this wonderful uh, secret that they, has been revealed to them and to nobody else, and all you have to do is believe what I say and do what I say. And then the secret will be revealed to you and you'll have blessings untold. I see that all in all sorts of Christianity today. I see that in preaching of various shapes, forms and others today. I see people saying, if you want to be blessed, God wants you to be blessed. So just do these things and you'll be blessed. Paul, I think Paul would say this. How can we be more blessed than we already are in Christ? We have everything in Christ. Now, granted, our walk is essential for us to maintain our, our uh, fellowship and our experience of grace in this life. And that's why he says in the fifth chapter, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Let's see how much time I have. Well, gosh, 30 seconds. He gets to the fruit of the Spirit. I want to say this in closing. Uh, there's so much more about this, and I, I, I'm sorry, but it's just, a, it's just a whole lot, and it's wonderful to me. I hope it stirs your mind to study Galatians more. But the fruit of the Spirit that he mentions, for the longest, I used to think he's talking about individuals and the fruit of the Spirit for them as individuals. And that's not to say that it's not, but I think more importantly than the individual, he's talking about the community of the church. That was the dreaded, the dreaded sound. What did I do? I guess it didn't matter. The fruit of the Spirit is something that identifies activities. It's not so much that Paul's saying, here's how you know if you're a child of God, or here's how you have faith because you're born again. That, that is, an, I think, a secondary issue to what his real point is. His real point is this is how the true community of Christ is to go about living their life. It should be a life full of these nine things. And to have these nine things, you must walk in the Spirit. You must obey the truth of the gospel. You must uh, stay away from the yoke of bondage. Now, this church was in a lot of trouble, and they needed help. And the, what Paul says in the first verse of the sixth chapter of Galatians, in my opinion, 
is this. You people who know better, who are manifesting the fruit of the Spirit in this church, work patiently, meekly, kindly, lovingly, faithfully with those who are struggling with the bad doctrine that they've swallowed from these bad teachers. It takes everyone in the church for the church to be what the church is supposed to be. And for us as primitive Baptists, what I wish for more than anything else is that we would all help one another bear the fruit of the Spirit, to see more faith, love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, to see those things in abundance in the church. And of course, it's got to be seen in individuals, but he's talking about the church, brethren. And this is the great power of Paul's writings to Galatians. Here is the answer to the Calvinistic preachers of today. It's not about competing to see who's doing better in their service to God. It's not about who's, who's the more faithful or the more, the more obedient person and the one who's, more, who's better at duty, faith, and others. No, it is about love, faith which worketh by love. And in this world today, the church needs to be exemplifying that love, which was exemplified by our Savior, Jesus Christ. I have to quit, so I quit. Thank you. <laughs> Amen, Brother Mike. Amen. <laughs> yes, sir. Amen, buddy. Good stuff. Yeah. It's too much. It's way too much. I want, I want <laughs> to uh, let our audience know that the rule of 20 is dad's idea. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's so, right. He, this is, he broke his own rule tonight. <clears throat> well, how far over the 20 did I go? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> two minutes. Hey, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Put your, put your I, I, I can far enough. Over that. Brother Mark, go ahead. Brother Mike. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you, dear brother. Thank you. Um, you you have a wonderful gift that always gets my mind just <laughs> going in 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 so many different directions. I think you bring out a lot of good things. I think you brought out a lot of good things tonight on that fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5 and 22 and 23, um, you had said that obviously that fruit of the spirit is given in the new birth. And I believe you, you'd said that, but that it's not just, uh, <clears throat> and correct me if I'm wrong and I'll, I'll be quiet here in a second and let you respond to this before I go to my next uh, question. Uh, that fruit's not, given to us just so that we have it, but it's given to us so that we would both have it and use it. Is, is that, is that a good synopsis of what you were saying? Or? Yes. Okay. That's you it. <laughs> oh, you don't have to say anything else. Yes. is fine. I'm just a little bit taken aback, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, yes. Can, um, can say, Mark, can I just say this before you go on? Sure. My point is, we, we tend to use Galatians 5, 22, 23 is to say, here's how you have faith. Mm -hmm. You have the spirit first, mm -hmm. and then you have faith as a result. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, but I don't see that as Paul's primary point in listing the fruit of the spirit. He's not saying, here's how you get faith. Here's how you get joy. He's mm -hmm. saying, here are the things that separate you and the church, especially the church, the community, from those who have become entangled in the yoke of bondage. Because those people, they're going in the opposite direction. They're not walking in the spirit, they're walking in the flesh. Right. And if you walk in the flesh long enough, you're gonna start seeing a manifestation in the community of the works of the flesh. So what we, what we want to see is people standing fast in the liberty that we have given to us by Christ. So I'll stop. No, that's great. That's, that's a great clarification. Uh, the, I mean, in, in in Galatians 5, uh, verse 19, he says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. So there's it's not just that the works of the flesh are there, but they're manifest. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and then he says, but in contrast, the fruit of the spirit, which we could also say that is manifest, yeah. uh, is love, joy, peace, and everything. And I like the lead into Galatians chapter 6, verse, verse 1. 
And then verse verse two, uh, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And I think it, it goes in line with what you're saying. The frustration of the Apostle Paul to the Galatians was obviously to the to the Galatian churches. And, you know, that he said, I marvel that you're so soon removed. Um, but his I think the bulk of his frustration was more so with those that were trying to subvert what the apostle Paul preached to them. And I think there is a correlation or a parallel to nowadays where people would subvert what has been preached to us and don't be shocked, but oftentimes, or at least sometimes that subversion happens from within it's somebody. And you'd mentioned that. And I believe me, Texas, Texas, we've had our share uh of people that would lead astray it w- it's almost like it's a re- repeat of what happened at the churches at galatia yes mm-hmm. um the apostle paul i want to read a couple of verses real quick the apostle paul says in second corinthians chapter 11 for i am jealous over you with godly jealousy for i have espoused you to one husband that i may present you as a chaste virgin to christ but i fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So I think it's important to understand that this gospel that Paul preached to the churches of Galatia, it was not a simple gospel, but it is the simplicity. In other words, the gospel is not something that's complex that they're like, like the law. Mm. It's not something that's complex that would drive away the believer, but it's something that presents the simplicity of Christ such that it draws in the believer. And then the worst thing that could happen is for somebody to come in and say, well, don't really listen to Paul. I've got, really the the right thing you've got to do and step one is you've got to be circumcised you know yeah. that that obliterates the simplicity as it is in christ yeah you know, uh, that's a great point that's a great point amen. a lot of people say i want simplicity but it's really people get uh attracted by complexity they like right. they yeah. like yes. they like all the pieces to, to they like to like a jigsaw puzzle yeah they like complexity when they can't handle complexity. And when Paul says, stand fast in the freedom wherewith Christ hath made us free. Yes, that's exactly what you were saying. Yeah, we're in that freedom that Christ yep. has made, but we have to stand fast in it. I, yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I really Absolutely. Could. And and finally, I know that, um, you know, Paul mentions about the salvation in the gospel in Romans chapter 1. And he mentions it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he talks about, I preached, you heard, you believe. And then it says, wherein you stand, you know, if you hold, if you keep that, which I've preached. Yeah, keep in memory. That's it. You keep in memory that which I've preached to you. If you believe in vain, yeah. Yeah. And then it it goes to the point that it's a constant reminder of what Jesus Christ has done, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Uh, That constant reminder. Um, I want to say one more thing with regard to Galatians. And I do want to ask you uh, a question for, for clarification and then I'll be quiet. Um, You know, um, dad used to be accused of being loud, right? Oh, uh, no, I know. No, I know. That's a no. shock. That's a shock to everybody that knew him. And uh, somebody said, Brother Jay, hey, you know, I think, you know, you're, you are you got to tone it down some. You're just a little bit too loud. And Dad, <laughs> Dad, Dad would quote Paul's comment to Galatia, the churches of Galatia. I desire to be present among you that I might change my voice. And yeah. then Dad would say, well, let me ask you something. You think Paul was going, wanting to go back over there so he could whisper to him? <laughs> <laughs> I think you brought. I think you brought out <laughs> the sentiment that Dad uh, presented. There is that Paul was upset. <clears throat> he was angry. Yeah, 
he yeah, was yeah. angry with the churches at that they had so easily been swayed, but he was really angry with those that had come in and swayed them. Mm -hmm. And that's why he tells the apostle P, uh, the story about Peter in Jerusalem when he said, I confronted him to the face. Peter was wrong. Mm -hmm. Peter was wrong. And by Peter's actions, he knew that he, Peter knew he was wrong but he was doing it because he felt like that that's what needed to be done. Even after Cornelius. Oh my goodness. Even after um, maybe the Jerusalem council. <laughs> yeah, it had, well, it had, it was after the Jerusalem council. It was after Cornelius. You know, I perceive of a truth that God is not a respecter of persons. Um, we've got to hang all, we've got to hang on to that. We, we can't fall into the trap of the churches of Galatia. We've got to we've got to stand fast in that liberty. We've got to maintain that which the apostles preached, that which our Lord Jesus Christ had preached. Now, let me ask you one last thing: is give me, and and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. Give me a parallel. Give me a parallel, uh, uh, an example of today where Ooh. this is happening, or do yes. you see one, or is there one? I think we saw an example in the uh, encroachments of Calvinism, uh, where because Calvinism, absolute predestination, are, are are all things <clears throat> that sound an awful lot like what we believe, but it's got too much poison in it to be of any good. But Calvinism, in particular, because what it says is, if you are a child of God you will do certain things. Right. And if you don't do certain things, you're not, or you never were a child of God. That's poison. Yeah. And I see that. That's not maybe the only parallel, but that is one that comes to mind where <clears throat> men who are extremely well schooled in seminary thinking and read a lot of Puritan writings and have soaked it all in and become true fanatical believers of it, they generate an energy of buzz that becomes attractive to people because it says, yes, election is true, but if you're an elect, you're going to believe the gospel. Mm, yeah. You're going to join the church. You're going to be a good little boy and girl. <clears throat> so it, I think that's a very good parallel to what was happening to the Galatians. They were, they were told... Paul didn't tell you everything. You, you've got some things to do. If you really want to be a child of God, you've got to do these things. If you are a child of God, you will willingly do these yeah. things. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Brother Mike. Appreciate that. Uh, Brother Mike Hughes. Uh, Brother Mike, I really enjoyed your thoughts this evening. Uh, prompted a lot of a lot of um, thinking and... and um, thoughts as well and i think uh, you're you're certainly right on there i wanted to dwell a little bit you you touched a little on the the culture of of the jewish society and and how that you know plays out and we see that in the scripture we see that with the pharisees we see that uh rigidness is still with us today mm -hmm. in that that regard but I also wanted to, to get your thoughts on this. And then I want to, to look at some, some thoughts of, of Christ over in 13 John and, and as well Paul's uh, comments in, in Ephesians. But do you see this when you come down to the root of it? You know, we talk about human nature and we have the Adamic nature of man, but we have the spiritual nature of Christ with us. Do you see this as being prejudice, envy? Uh, how do you see that? You know, that, that root cause, why is it that people are drawn to, to follow these things mm -hmm. and to, to take, want to take this on? There's something about uh, we want to take this on, it seems like. And then how do you see that contrast in what Christ did in, in um, 13 John there when he took the wash basin and he knelt down and he washed the disciples' feet. 
And he says, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. How do we hold that truly in our hmm. heart? And then as all of these things that you brought out so well for us, these come in, you know, I see such a contrast from, from what had been brought into the false teaching. And then here's the, the simplicity in the teaching of Christ, as you were talking about, Brother Mark. And, and he says, you know, we're to do these things. This is what he says. You're to do these things, to, to bow at one another's feet. And then the apostle says over in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Yeah. How do you see this, Brother Mike, in, in the context of um, forgiveness? You know, mm. if, if, you know, what he says there in that first verse of six in Galatians, you know, brother overtaken in a fault, you know, we're to help one another. I see that we have a big problem with forgiveness. And, Amen. and I'm just saying that in general, you know, not anything in particular, but it, it becomes a real problem. And then it seems like we fall back into, uh, well, it's it's got to be this way. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. Well, you know, sometimes we we sin and there's, there's not a lot we can do about history, you know, but God can forgive us and God forgives us. <laughs> So I'd, I'd like to know your thoughts on that just a little bit, if you would, brother. Well, uh, excellent, excellent thoughts and questions, Brother Mike. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I think, again, we must say that this is not a Jewish problem. It's a human yeah. problem. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very it's good. as much our problem as it is the Jews or any society that has tried to abide by certain ways of doing things and thinking you know <clears throat> for one thing the human nature is uh is there's strength in numbers mm. and we all we all have to walk the same way we all have to think the same way we don't want any any oddballs or any uh, square pegs and round holes so we we want conformity mm. that's the that is the bedeviling thing for the church is when we <clears throat> become too concerned with conformity to a certain pattern of thinking. Uh, it, it makes you unable to see that God has other people that are his just as much as you think you are his, that are just as worthy of his fellowship and are our fellowship. So, you know, I think the fear of being different, the fear of having difference, the fear of diversity, for one thing. I think diversity is the most power, one of the more powerful things that can happen to a church is diversity. Yeah. Yet we are afraid of it. We're afraid to have diversity. We want sameness. We want commonness. And we, we, we call fellowship sameness or we call sameness fellowship. But fellowship is where you are so in love with the Lord and so in love with all the Lord loves. And, and when you have the kind of attitude of love that Jesus had and that he charged us to have, then you're going to look for ways to include rather than to uh, divide. You're going to look for uh, opportunities for peace and spirituality in that piece, then you are just to have people be quiet, not speak up and uh, cause trouble, as we would call it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a hard thing, Brother mm -hmm. Mike. But I think Paul is Paul said, I'm all things to all men. That didn't mean he was a compromiser. That didn't mean he was a, um, a cheat or a swindle. But he, he wanted every child of God to experience the blessings of the gospel that he was blessed to experience. Shouldn't we want that for every one of God's children? That's Amen. good. They have that wonderful blessedness, sure. that, that wonderful assurance. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if I could got to your 
question though, Brother Mike. Was there? Uh, well, I think you gave me some some insight there, and, and you mentioned one thing about spiritual peace. What elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, I say that as a way of it's it's maybe uh, um, arbitrary on my part. But there is a piece that I think is just, uh, uh, you know, keep, keep in line. Mm -hmm. That's not spiritual peace, not necessarily. Spiritual peace is, let's, what does the Lord, what would the Lord have us to do? Yeah. What does the Bible say? Mm -hmm. Let's follow the Lord, but from a motivation of love, not, not of conformity but of love. If we, if we love each other as Christ loved us, I assure you the, the problems that people are afraid of won't be nearly uh, as bad as they think it will be. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, yeah. we will be able to overcome any of those problems. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Brother Dave. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, brother Mike, uh, uh, I, I wrote this. All, all heresy is really an effort for designing men to exert control over the sheep of God. I agree. Okay, totally. and that's you find that in in Galatians because you look at the heresies and that are even the Bible and it's and it started really with uh, circumcision, which is I think the main thrust of things. Uh. It's the next word. We, we have control. We can control whether you're saved or not. So you need to come to us to, to take care of this. The Jews even used circumcision to gain control over their enemies in Jacob's day. Uh, and we see how that happened. We see the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Uh, that's the presbytery is elevated above the regular membership. And it's where we get our word laity, which I hope primitive Baptists never use because it's yeah. classification, which you're either a saint or a sinner. That's all the classifications <laughs> we need. You know, the resurrection is past. Well, what if the resurrection is past? Well, you better come to us because we know what the Lord hadn't told you yet. So if you want to get up there into heaven, there's some secret will. There's some secret stuff that you've talked about. Or the resurrect, there is no resurrection. So, so what else? What, 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 what do we do? Well, we know we, you got to come to us. Uh, preacher worship in Galatians, I, Paul, I, Apollos. And then the communion drunken feast. Well, if you want to have a good time, come to us because we got the wine, we got everything. You can, you can get drunk and still be in the will of God. <laughs> this is all, it's all, all there in the scripture. So, we need to be very careful when we take away the sovereignty of God, any portion of the sovereignty of God, anything, any little bit of God's sovereignty, and give that to men. That's heresy, in my opinion. That's really what heresy is, and that's Galatians. And you talked about the, the, the progression of it. Now, there's a question I'm going to ask. And it's not in the book of Galatians. Actually, it's in the book of Acts. Because really, they, you know, it really didn't start with Paul preaching to Cornelius. Peter. Uh, Peter, sorry. Thank you. Now, he got in trouble, but he, but he explained it away, and they were fine. So everything was all right. The Jews were dispersed. Things started happening in Antioch. They, you know, they sent Paul, they sent a, a Paul, Barnabas. Right. Sent Barnabas. Mm -hmm. Barnabas found Saul, which became Paul, and they stayed at Antioch for a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then the, the Spirit of God called Barnabas and Saul. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind, all this happened before the Council of Jerusalem. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And they went on and they preached to the Gentiles. They preached to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles believed. And then it ha it happened. It happened. Uh, now, now it happened here in the thirteenth chapter of Acts. I believe in 
another town called Antioch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Pisidia. Antioch and Pisidia. It happened there when it says in verse 44, the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. That's Jew and Gentile. The Jews were, they, when they saw the multitudes, they realized we aren't in control anymore. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. And they were moved with envy. Yep. Now, all heresy is rooted in pride. Mm. Mm-hmm. All right. That's mm-hmm. what it is. And it's rooted, and it's also, that's the root. The stem is a desire to exert control over the flock. Calvinism, such a thing. Arminianism, such a thing. Absolute predestination, such a thing. It's all can be found in it. And it's all, they. it's moved with envy and a desire. I got to have control. I got to have, I got to be a cog in this thing. They were moved with envy. So what did they do? They spoke against the things they were rejoicing at the week before. Now, here's here's a question. I'm going to make a statement, uh, what I think about this scripture, and then I want you to tell me whether I'm right or wrong. It's the 46th verse of the 13th chapter of Acts. After the Jews saw, moved with envy, they... they uh, they contradicted what they believed. They blasphemed the belief, the things they were rejoicing. Verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should have been spoken to you, to the Jews. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Well, I think Paul was, or Saul or Paul, whatever he was then, was speaking in a very J.A. Rowell Jr. voice when he said that. All right. I think he was a little bit loud. He's getting a little bit upset there. All right. Here's the question in verse 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for a salvation unto the ends of the earth. I waffle on that scripture. Okay. I like the scripture because it sheds light on Paul on, on Paul's conversion, on things we did was not recorded when he was called of God on the road to Damascus. Apparently, this was conveyed to Paul in that city, in that time. He told Ananias, God told Ananias, I'm gonna show him the things he must suffer for my sake. But in here, he's going to be a light. He's going to be a light to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. All right? And um, he said, but but I have a problem with that thou. I've set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. What is that? He, it, now, I know that's not saying that Paul or Saul is responsible for their eternal salvation, but I can't help but believe that there's some eternal salvation in there. Uh, can you help me understand that a little bit better there, Brother Mike? Well, that wasn't my text, so I'm not sure I can. But... I know, but 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 it's sort of your sort of. I will, I will give you my two cents worth. I'll give Go you ahead, my... please. Because uh, going back to the sixth chapter of Galatians, mm-hmm. you notice that he says, what a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Yes, sir. And if you sow to the flesh, you shall reach, reach, uh, reap mm-hmm. damnation or, or mm-hmm. judgment, or I forget the word. Okay. But if you sow to the spirit, you shall reap life everlasting. Yes. Now, is that how they got everlasting life? By No, no. Reading? I think it means that uh, they were enjoying everlasting life right now in this life. Mm. The everlasting life that they would have in the fullness, mm-hmm. they had they had the foretaste of it right now. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so uh, they weren't the doers of their, the creators of their own etern- 
everlasting life. And Paul, Paul would never agree to, to the thought that he was responsible or pivotal in people becoming children of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think he is saying that it was prophesied of him. I really believe that it, it touches upon his work in a prophetic way was to, was to bring light Yes. Life was was say in Second Timothy chapter one and verse ten brought life and immortality to the light. To light, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's what he's getting at. Is that he is he is going to be instrumental in revealing their salvation. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. And so then you would say that the next verse, and when the Gentiles heard this. They were glad, mm -hmm. yeah, and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Yes, I think that confirms point. that. Yeah. Okay. Yes, they found that. Yeah. Okay. And, and we can say Paul was instrumental in them understanding that they were, they did have eternal life, mm -hmm. not because. Paul gave it to him, but because the Lord blessed Paul to preach to them and they saw Christ and him crucified and they saw why he was crucified. He was crucified for them. And, and it was Christ and Christ alone that made them worthy of everlasting life. Amen. Okay. And do you think that that is the fault or maybe the fault in Galatians six and one, if a brother be overtaken in a fault? Yes. Yes. You think that's the main thrust of that word? Yes. This there, there are some who forgot that or were or had been deluded into thinking otherwise. Yep, there were some that were still in the truth. Mm -hmm. These are the spiritual ones, the ones who still believed in salvation by grace. Right. And so they are the ones that Paul was was counting on to work with those who had fallen away to restore them, because that's the word used is to restore them yeah. Yeah. back to the position yeah. they had yeah. before. <laughs> that thank you that really opens up a lot i appreciate that okay okay uh this is possibly the largest amount of sticky notes i've ever had uh so let's see how this goes all right so dad let's uh <clears throat> professor professor dad uh let's let's summarize what is in a sentence or less what is the problem the problem that you were talking about that the church has what is the problem um the problem is in a sense well that's tough for me you know that's i need a paragraph i need an actual chapter yeah no why why do you think i asked it that way uh, <clears throat> the problem as it was then was the integration of uh, by people of a culture that of, of another people that was of a vastly different culture. Okay. And so, that, so, okay. So in what way is that problem still our problem today? Uh, it is when people say that you aren't doing things right, you got to do it this way. And it's usually not the people who are doing what's right. It's usually the people who want to do wrong. But they they are saying that what we have is what's right. You've got if you want to be a part of what we are, and what we are is better than what you are. If you want to be a part of what we are, you got to drop what you got and take on what we got. So the problem is, in a literal sense, bad theology. Very heresy. bad he heresy. It's but, like your uncle David said. Yes, it's people who say I'm superior to you. What you got is not is okay, but it's not nearly as good as what I got. Right. I got something a lot better than what you got. So you need to conform to the what I'm saying, so you can have what I've got. And that's, you... that's always that always happens within the church. We're not talking about new converts coming in, so right. per se. Yeah. As we are saying, is somebody saying like, uh, like the Garden of Gethsemane guys, we got a special insight that you don't have about redemption. So what you've been taught about redemption is wrong. Drop it. 
take what we got and go have this special knowledge that hasn't ever been in the church before until now. So, so the problem is heresy that feels very special and the identifying characteristics of it. I, I think I boiled it down to three words, okay. conformity, prejudice, and power. Yeah, that's good. Okay. <laughs> so these are, I think what's most important is there are two aspects, I think, to what you were talking about. There's the actual by the numbers aspect, which is this doctrine is wrong, this doctrine is wrong, this doctrine, doctrine is wrong. And then there are the ways that these doctrines manifest and how the people that believe these things deal with, with children of God. Thank you for bringing that up. That is a key point that I didn't really touch on like I should have. Mm -hmm. You know, what, the, what the, the false teacher's doctrine, what it did is it caused people to be competitive with one another, mm -hmm. to be aggravated, irritated, sore with one another, provoking each other, looking down their noses at each other. Uh, competing or measuring themselves by each other to see who's doing a better job, not helping someone who's not doing as well to get better, uh, but rather looking down your nose at them and glad to go down there because it makes you feel superior. That's the effect of false teaching or of heresy upon God's people. It, it doesn't bring about right. the love of Christ. It brings about war. It brings about hostility. The uh, I've, Something that I I'd like to say is that uh, the Beatitudes, you know, Jesus Sermon on the Mount, when he's talking a lot of duty, basically, that's doctrine in action. If you believe in salvation by grace, if you believe in the doctrine of election, if you believe in these things, then you will act in this way. And that's what Paul was saying in, in Galatians six, Daniel. Yes. I think and from verse 1 to verse 10, he's saying, here is the fruit of the Spirit in action. Right. Mm -hmm. That And that's, oh, okay, okay, all right. Um, so in our time, um, and, and this is, and I hope I'm not too forward with this, I, I just think this is something that we've talked about on the broadcast before, and, and I think it's important um, that, and I'm not going to list any orders, but there are, uh, and we know these, that there are churches out there today, not primitive Baptist churches. I'm not, I'm not, there are churches of people that believe vastly different things that we believe while still believing in uh, a Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And um, and they come with all of this um, very attractive packaging. And the attractive packaging um, comes in the form of outreach, which in and of itself is not bad. An emphasis on uh, taking care of the kids, which in and of itself is not bad, but you take all of these things that seemingly are either benign to very appealing, and then you get into that place, you get into that church, and that's when you start to peel, the curtains come back, and then all of, all of a sudden the spiritual quality that the people of that church actually share is that of conformity, prejudice, control, power, competition, all of these things. And I think the, the most dangerous one, particularly for the primitive Baptists, is conformity. Um, because it's the, it's the one that looks the most friendly, I think. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, I mean, I remember. <laughs> I remember stories from you guys. I never lived this, but this is from y'all. I remember when uh, ministers would say so, uh, when y'all would say stuff like the ministers that raised you, like Bill Walden and older, well, we don't need an air conditioning system. We, we've been preaching with the Spirit without one for however long. You know, and I think for us in particular, sometimes the line between natural considerations and conformity can get blurred. And, uh, and natural considerations are fine. We're using Zoom right now, okay? I have a space heater. Why? Because there's no heat in this office and it's negative 47 degrees outside. Natural considerations are a good thing. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, you start getting these ideas. Okay, well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? 
they corrupt each other, okay? <laughs> it's not just that all of a sudden there's bad heresy coming in, there's heresy coming in, heresy coming in, and now you're acting a certain way. Well, that is possible, but it's also possible the other way around. There's bad ideas, bad ideas, bad actions that will evolve into bad heresy. And it, w it was not a bad thing for our forefathers to stop and say, hey, let's actually think about air conditioning before we jump into it, because we need to make sure this is just a natural consideration and nothing more. Th yes. That is, th the churches out there that are stuck in the problem got started by taking care of natural considerations and then letting it get out of control letting it get out of control, get out of control, and now all of a sudden they have a beautifully prepackaged church that is not filled with the Spirit. Mm. It's filled with competition, with conformity, with prejudice, with power, with control. And that should not be our church. That Amen. should not be us. Amen. Now, the other problem, and I'm sorry I'm taking enough time. Uh, okay, the other problem was, I think, what you talked about at the end when you came back to chapter six, which was the frustration that those of us feel who see the problem with people that are engaged with the problem. This is something that has, uh, I, this is something that I have felt. And especially we as ministers, and I'm gonna be very, very careful right here. We as ministers, how we speak, it is so, we are listened to. And when the thing that we speak, if you say the right thing the wrong way, it was the wrong thing to say. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are brothers and sisters out there that are frustrated with people that are caught in the problem. And the solution to it is chapter six. Amen. Be patient. <clears throat> Don't start throwing fireballs. Okay, this isn't Mario. But just be patient. I mean, Super Mario. A Super Mario. You're correct. Yeah. I don't be know patient. I don't yeah. Okay. Little sermonette over with. Do you have any? Do you have any comments, thoughts, concerns there, Dad? I agree. I, I would say Paul says we're to, we're to bear one another's burdens, and we're to bear our own burdens, and that means we are to help others while we walk our walk of faith. Mm -hmm. Right. And we are not to get in people's way as they walk their walk of faith. Sure. Amen. And remember that God does give us good teachers. And if we are blessed with good teachers, we should communicate to them in those good things that they've communicated to us. And we should support them, pray for them, work with them, help them in any way that we yes, can. Yes, yes, it's through yes. preaching the gospel that problems are solved. Right. Yes. yes. And, amen. Well, I'm gonna write that down. That's a good one. Um, I, that's that's all I got, brother. Brother Jerry, clean up my mess, please. I did no mess. That time is time is spent. Um, no, but I do, no, no, no. I do want to make maybe just a couple of quick points. Um, things that you stirred my mind with, brother Mike, and then and ask you to elaborate a little bit further on something you've already said, and it was kind of connected with brother but brother Mark asked as well. I think all of us here um, on, on the panel and probably everybody listening um, knows um, by word and maybe by experience that, that bad doctrine will result in bad practice. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that will happen. Now, bad practice can affect the doctrine as well. But I think if, uh, if you have bad doctrine, um, it, it won't be long before uh, behavior and, and practice and, and all of those things start falling aside. There's a sense of thing as cultural divide and doctrinal divide. And, and I think, you know, in, the, in Romans, the Roman letter is pretty well dealt with cultural divide, maybe some doctrinal issues as well. But Galatians had both. Yep. Right. Yes. And I really appreciate uh, how you have approached the, uh, the whole thought and conversation about the letter and, and its very specific application by Paul. Not only that, I also appreciate the urgency that you conveyed that you believe that Paul had 
Um, and, and I think that that's something that, that we all should take away um, uh, from that as well. As we study God's word and the Lord burdens our heart and there's something in front of us that we know that the word of God will clearly address that we don't hold back. We don't hold back. Everything we do must be done in love. And I think we, we understand yes, that. Amen, brother Jerry. Yeah. But I know I've been guilty of sugarcoating things, hoping that the individual might get the subtle message that I'm trying to deliver, trying to be, you know, all of these warm and fuzzy things. And, and then I, I question why it is that there's no change in behavior. <laughs> well, there's the answer. <laughs> I'm the problem, right? Uh, or at least part of the problem. Um, I, an observation, Brother Mike. Uh, I, it's interesting in, in comparing Galatians and Ephesians relative to the actual uh, issue or matter of Jew and Gentile and to see how Paul dealt with them uh, a single problem, if you will, or a single matter, but he dealt with them very differently. Um, and at the Church of Galatia, I mean, you, you've said plainly, he had issues with the, the Jews of the Jews that were really driving the problem, right? The, the, the certain group, and he was angry about it. And he was addressing them, not exclusively, but certainly primarily, who have bewitched you and, and all of the, these types of comments. And in, in the Ephesian letter, um, I, I believe he makes such a beautiful case for the Gentiles to understand what they have been brought into. Yeah, I agree. Right? It, and he makes this point, and I, I, it hit my mind when you were preaching about this. The uncircumcision was a title given to the Gentiles by the Jews. Yes. That's what Paul said. Yes. Uh, that's wrong at its base. Yes. What are they doing? Right. Labeling. Right. Labeling someone that is not them. Right. I mean, yes. that at its core is, uh, is, is an ungodly behavior, plain and simple. Amen. Okay. And then Paul makes the point in, in Ephesians, and I know I know you didn't preach out of Acts, but you handled what Brother David gave to you. And I know you didn't <laughs> preach out of Ephesians, okay? And we'll get back to Galatians in a minute. But Paul made this point, and I thought it was interesting as, as I was listening to you. Paul makes the point in Ephesians that of twain, Christ made one new man. Mm -hmm. right. Both entities that are of the twain, were they had their status improved, both of them, <laughs> right? I agree. Very good and, point. And it's it's un it's unthinkable sometimes when we uh, adopt a posture of uh, of superiority, yeah. of um, feeling as though we're entitled. You know, this mm -hmm. there's a sense of entitlement that exists in the world right. today. Mm -hmm. I got news for you; it exists in the church too. Yeah, mm -hmm. boy, does it ever. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it. Mm -hmm. And the Lord won't have it. Not I mean, right. there's no place for that in, in God's word whatsoever. Right. Amen. Nope. And I think in large part, that's why um, Paul was so animated um, in his addressing the, the issue at the church, at the churches in Galatia, um, because he, he knew at its root, it was rotten, just, just rotten. Um, back to Galatia the church, the, the letter to the Galatians. Um, I love the biblical lesson on um, sowing and reaping. Mm. It, it is so, such a wonderful lesson. And maybe it's, I don't know, I can, ju it just, re I can relate to it. And, and one thing that I believe that Paul is teaching there and, and specific to the bad behavior of um, the, the folks that he's really addressing it to is that your reaping is going to directly coincide in, in amount and portion and quality, depending upon whom you are sowing the seed unto. If you sow the seed unto the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. Right. Okay. Uh, you may get immediate and quick gratification from it in some way, shape or form, like, you know, circumcision of the flesh, right? Something quick. And that you can put some emphasis upon, but it's going to fade away. It, it's, it, there's, it's corrupt at its base. But if you sow seed unto the spirit, you reap 
life everlasting, mm-hmm. right. something that is not corrupt and that will not fade away. I kind of liken it to, I don't, I don't buy organic because the stuff rots faster than the real stuff. <laughs> oh, there he is. Don't let my wife hear you say that. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I'll, I, I'll wait until the fruit comes in season <laughs> because I can't eat it fast enough where it goes bad. <laughs> okay. Now that's probably a very crude uh, illustration. To it. <laughs> now that may be the best point made all night right there. Yeah. <laughs> point, right? Listen, if we, are, if we are sowing to an immediate gratification to our flesh, it's corrupt at its base and it right. will end in corruption. That's yes. right, buddy. Plain and simple. Yep. Contrary to that, sowing to the spirit uh, brings us in connection with, with life everlasting. Amen. So my question to you is Galatians 6 and 2. You've already spent a little bit of time with it. Bear ye one another's burdens. And I think Brother Mark in his, uh, in his comments and question, I think he brought it in as well. My question is very specific. Tell us if you can, um, in a, as many words as you want to, what is the law of Christ that Paul is pointing to within the context of, of what he's teaching here and the bad behavior that he's, he's trying to root out? What, did, what do you think the law of Christ is in that respect? Uh, there's two places elsewhere in Galatians that I think he touches on the answer. And one is in the fifth chapter mm. where he says um, in the 14th verse, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, sure, okay. even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor. Mm-hmm. As there you Amen. go. Amen. Amen. That's good. And at the end of the, around the 10th chapter of the sixth, 10th verse of the 6th chapter. Um, no, that's not it. Uh, where it says, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Where does it say that? Oh, yeah, the second verse. And so fulfill the law of, verse, the law of Christ. Well, if you go down to the ninth and 10th verses, I think this is the, the, the summing up of the whole epistle right here. Yeah. And I'll just read it. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Mm -hmm. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Yeah. Especially unto them who are the household faith. Amen, amen. 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 And he's speaking to the people who know better and who he expects to do better. He, he's looking to the people he expects to solve the problem. Yep. To heal the wound. Man, I'm yeah. so glad that you you, you went there. Um, it, it's so easy to get weary. Yeah. 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 It's so easy to get weary and impatient. Jeez. And, you know, if you're going to wait for fruit to come forth and to ripen, you got to be patient. You got to mm. be patient. You got to be diligent. And if you're if you get weary, you're going to be eating green fruit, and that's not good for you. <laughs> that's right. You know, uh, before I forget, brother Jerry, and I don't want to cut uh, to cut into your time, but oh, uh, I'm done. is also almost word for word what he says in the twelfth chapter of Romans, mm. close, close to the end of it there. And you know, of course, slightly different emphasis or focus in Romans than in Galatians. Yep. But it's the same. It's the same truth. It's the same gospel. And I won't read it, but I mean. You know what I'm talking about, yep. and 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 it's the same answer for for different problems. It's yep. and it really it's really uh, <laughs> important what we believe. And I think the better the meat of Galatians about is about doctrine. Yeah, but all that doctrine means nothing. It means absolutely nothing if it's not put into practice. Right. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. Well said. It won't. It won't solve any problem. It won't. You know. <clears throat> I see uh, this spirit sometime among our people. We had so many people come to church today. Man, we had a house full of people come to church today. Mm. We have so many people. Uh, we had so many people join last year. We have so many people join here now. Already, we've had this many people join. 
Uh-huh. Great and wonderful and fantastic. But you know what I yes. get the impression sometimes? Yes. We're doing a lot better than anybody else. Yeah. Mm. That's it. Yeah. And if you want to, uh, if you're not seeing that kind of success in your church, maybe you need to be doing what we're doing in our church. <laughs> you know, that sounds a lot like Paul would fall fought there in Galatians. Now, yeah. I want to see old school full of good old bad. <laughs> See Purcell and Golden Gate and Vernia and Farmersville and everywhere. I want all our churches to do the very best that they can do to the glory of God. Amen. Well, do we want that. But when you get a jolly from making it, you know, making it look like I'm doing pretty good. Uh, oh, yeah. Good oh, point. yes, God gets the glory, but we're doing mm-hmm. pretty good. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, I, we hear these things. I'm not stupid. I know what's really happening with some of these brethren who talk about those kind of things. Yeah. And I say to them, and I say it to me. Yeah. Let, as, let us not be weary in well doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> let us love one another. Let us want the best for one another. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. Great lesson, Brother Mike. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It was it was actually Romans Romans twelve was the thought I didn't I didn't get to, um, and this just Romans twelve and two, and be okay. not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, and acceptable, and perfect will of God. What would Romans be without the twelfth, thirteenth, and fourteenth, and fifteenth chapter, or the sixteenth? Mm. What would Romans? I mean, it'd be great. It would be eleven chapters long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but what, 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 that Romans is what, what what makes it so great is that it has sixteen chapters. Those sixteen. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, we need every word. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Um, Good. Well, I, I mean, I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank for, you, Mike. That was yes. good. Really good. Uh, I'm edified. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Mike, for being with us tonight. Yes. Thank yes. You. We, we love you, and we, mm. we just love your, your spiritual, humble nature. We really do. We, we, yes, we, we love having you on. We can't wait to have you on again, Brother Mike. Look forward to it. Thank you. Brother, soon. And brother, brother Mark, who do we got on next week? Uh, Elder James Isaacs. What? Is, uh, okay. Next Wednesday night. All right. All right. Whoa. And don't forget, April the 21st, 21st will be our uh, next hard shelling session. Hard shell? Hard shells. And this up. was what broadcast tonight was number what? This was number 45. 45. Number 45. 40. Uh, y'all, y'all realize we've only been doing this for 10 months. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's that's crazy. Well, yeah, we I still like each other. We thank the Lord, but we thank everyone who listens and, oh and gosh, yes. come back every week and watch, listens to it, recordings, and thank you, thank you for sticking with us. Amen. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And thank you all so much for being here tonight. Uh, we will see y'all next week with Elder James Isaacs, and um, I believe the final closing prayer tonight. Oh, it's me. My turn. Yep. All right, so we'll say prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your felt presence with us. We thank you for this message that has come before and the truth that it brought, Lord. We thank you for the knowledge of what our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has done for us on the cross of Calvary. We are thankful for the knowledge of his resurrection. We are thankful for what we believe and how we believe it. Lord, continue to bless us to believe these things and bless us to act and walk in a way that is uh, good in thy sight and in alignment with the things that we believe. And we ask all of these continued favors and blessings. And Lord, please be with all of those without power tonight and uh, all of those that are uh, a little extra cold. Uh, help us come to a resolution of this situation and all these things we ask. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 And with that, we'll say good night. 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 Good night.